With the news that two cars have been disqualified from the recent United States Grand Prix over technical infringements regarding their skid blocks, a phrase kept on coming up which was the same word that Mercedes and Ferrari looked like when they found out the news they'd been disqualified. Planks. So what is a plank and why does Formula 1 insist on bolting a piece of wood onto the underside of cars? The year is 1994 and the Formula 1 world is looking back at the May Day weekend where it was just a weekend of carnage. Rubens Barrichello had his accident in practice that put him in a hospital and the following day Roland Ratzenberger's life is taken at the Villeneuve Kink. On the Sunday, three-time world champion Ayrton Senna's Williams leaves the road at Tamborello and slams into a concrete wall. He too is killed. Tamborello and Villeneuve would be turned into the chicanes we see today. Many more corners are reprofiled or removed entirely in a massive knee-jerk reaction to the two deaths. And on the cars, many more things would change. Since the banning of ground effect cars 12 years previous in 1982, which is coincidentally the last time that a driver had lost their life as a result of a crash at a Grand Prix weekend, teams have been looking for any way possible to claw back the lost downforce. As F1 entered the start of the 1990s, the cars were now so low they were basically scraping the tarmac. Craig Scarborough explained in an Autosport forum post back in 2008 that the floors on these cars were just totally flat, and the diffuser at the back was influential but less aggressive and underdeveloped versus the cars of today, because they weren't integrated into the rear of the car as much. The cars being so close to the ground meant that the diffuser was able to work and create plenty of downforce. And then Adrian Newey and Williams managed to figure out that if you controlled the ride height with active aerodynamics and turn the ride height down as the fuel burns off, you pretty much have all the downforce all the time. The teams would also be putting their exhausts into the diffusers to fire gases into them and create a primitive blown diffuser effect. Now this wasn't a blown diffuser in the same way we saw back in the early 2010s, as the exhausts were only blowing on throttle, and with most of the teams still running H-pattern gearboxes at the time, it meant that they only had the full extent of the blown diffuser when on the throttle, or when blipping the throttle on downshifts, which could make the cars twitchy, because you're only blipping every so often. These diffusers started to fall out of favour in the mid-90s, but some teams still tried to use them. Virtually everybody, with the exception of teams like 40, had now got these flappy paddle sequentials, and drivers now had one foot on the throttle and one on the brake. Drivers like Schumacher had worked out how to keep some of the throttle open all the time to get the exhaust to fire enough gas out the back to create some extra grip in the corners. But part of the reason they started abandoning these design concepts is because one of the knee-jerk reactions following the 1994 San Marino Grand Prix was the concerns of bottoming out at the high speeds these cars were achieving. Active suspension had been banned at the end of 1993 and by the end of that season the McLaren active suspension system was regarded as being more advanced than the one on the Williams, even though Williams was the one that pretty much invented it in Formula 1. I mean Lotus had tried it, Williams kind of, well, mastered it. So now going into 1994 the drivers weren't allowed to control their ride height on the fly or through a computer depending on which system you had. The reason active suspension was a considerable advantage was pretty simple. The more fuel you put in the car, the heavier it becomes. Then that weight pushes the car down. As the fuel burns off, the car becomes lighter and the ride height goes up as the suspension load is taken off. While the car will be faster on acceleration, you will lose a little bit of downforce because the car is higher off the ground than it was before. So with active suspension, they could turn the ride height down to where it was at the start of the race. Like mentioned before, maximum downforce all of the time. So now the teams are running the cars as low as they possibly can to the point where the diffuser is just about to stall so that when the fuel burns off and the ride height goes up they're not losing as much as they normally would but at least now they had refueling allowed in 1994 so the burn off isn't going to be as extreme but this is Formula 1. Give them an inch they'll take a mile. And even though this video isn't about Imola 1994 and I'm not going to argue what did and didn't cause Senna's crash, bottoming out was a concern for a few drivers during that Imola weekend, with Damon Hill taking a wider line through Tamborello to avoid the nasty bumps that were there. And at the start of that race weekend, they had tried to shave some of the bumps off. On the first lap following that safety car period, Senna showered Schumacher in sparks on the way through Tamborello as the protective metal skid blocks grinded away on the tarmac. You know, the wanted metal to grind at the tarmac instead of the bodywork. So in response to the accident, the FIA decided to take steps to make sure the teams weren't taking the mickey with ride heights anymore, and then mandated that this wooden plank would be fitted under all cars starting from around the Spanish Grand Prix of 1994. 
this would make sure that the car's ride heights were increased and then they produce less downforce, making the cars a little bit slower. In the technical regulations, the plank must meet the following criteria. It must have a width of 300 millimeters, which is about 12 inches, and then be 10 millimeters, which is almost half an inch thick, and that thickness had to be uniform along the plank when brand new. And it must be fixed symmetrically about the center line in such a way that it doesn't in itself become part of the car's aerodynamic properties, because you know what F1 teams are like. The plank used to be made out of a beechwood composite called Jabrock, who I believe is also a Romulan. This plank, though, hasn't been made out of wood since the late 1990s. These days, it's a non-flammable type of fiberglass which is strong, light, and has all sorts of other properties. It's just called the plank because it looks like a plank of wood, and that's what it originally was. It's like when you say you're going to tape a TV program, but what you really mean is you're going to record it onto your skybox. Nobody tapes things anymore, they haven't done for what? 20 years? And as is often the case with these rule changes, the design philosophies of the teams became different because they had to try and claw back what the FIA had taken away. And starting around kind of 1995-1996, people started noticing that one end of the car was noticeably higher than the front. When we think of this design concept, we think of what was happening three or four years ago, but that wasn't a new thing. Even pre-plank, this was a thing, and it was certainly more noticeable now, sort of 1995, 1996, 1997, because in 1995, Formula 1's design rules meant that now the car's floors had a 5cm tall and 50cm wide step on the floor, on top of this plank that they had to run on. They also changed the rules regarding the placement of bodywork and the sizes of the wings to try and reduce the downforce, and the purpose of the stepped floor was to reduce the effectiveness of the rear diffuser. The higher up off the ground it is, the less downforce the car can produce. Which sort of seems a bit weird, because towards the end of the 2017 to 2021 F1 regulations, the cars, particularly the Red Bull, had this face down booty up type of setup to create some extra suckage around the rear, as the teams were now able to use this stepped floor to be a major downforce producing area. They were able to use those steps as a shallow ground effect tunnel, which was a major producer of downforce in those days. Red Bull's design back then was artificially adding volume to the diffuser, so it was, in inverted commas, bigger than it actually was. More air is shoved through the diffuser, at higher speed. You get that negative pressure, the rear end is sucked to the ground, you can turn the rear wing down, you reduce drag, you go faster. Now though, Formula 1 has re-entered an era where having a car running low to the ground is of great importance, thanks to the ground effect nature of the cars. In the 1970s, when ground effect was first introduced to the sport with Lotus and the 79, the idea was to run the cars as low as humanly possible with the stiffest springs you can get, and then try to seal the sides off so a vacuum is created and then you're stuck to the ground. That's the theory anyway. Obviously, during 2022, there were the concerns of porpoising with several drivers experiencing some sort of issue or complaint. Kevin Magnussen having nerve problems after a race, Ricardo and Norris voicing concerns as well as the more high-profile issues suffered by Mercedes. So to combat this, the FIA said, okay, you have to raise the ride height a little bit so this isn't as much of a problem and everyone has more of an equal playing field to play on. And to try and explain this phenomenon, porpoising is caused because there is a thing with ground effect cars that if you run them too low to the ground, then the airflow actually stalls underneath. That low pressure that is there to suck the car down towards the ground suddenly produces high pressure and that pushes the car back up. As the car rises, physics goes, oh yeah, okay, I work now, and the car is sucked back down again. The problem is, this is happening over and over and over and over again. Either high frequency, low amplitude, as was suffered by Ferrari and a couple of other teams, or low frequency, high amplitude, which is the problem that Mercedes had. And this is why porpoising was a problem. Having the plank in 2023 is basically to function as it always has done. Make sure that teams aren't taking the mickey with low ride heights to produce as much downforce as they possibly can. But in 2023, Leclerc and Hamilton got caught out. And they're not the first to be caught out by this piece of wood either. Well, fiberglass. Because in 1994, Michael Schumacher was disqualified from the Belgian Grand Prix, which is a video I need to do at a later date because the plank was deemed to be too far worn. The reason being, Benetton claimed at the time, was because he'd spun over a kerb, which at the time was built like the ones outside your house that separate the pavement from the road. In 2001, Jarno Trulli's Jordan was disqualified from the United States Grand Prix for the same offence, but Jordan was able to successfully appeal and the car was reinstated due to a steward not being present when the decision to disqualify the car was made. 
as the process was not followed correctly, Trulli was given his fourth place back. But outside of Formula 1, Andre Lotterer and his two co-drivers in their Audi R18 were disqualified from the 2016 Six Hours of Silverstone, when their skid blockers would be on the 20mm allowed under the rules set out in the FIA World Endurance Championship. As such, they were removed from the standings and victory was handed to Porsche instead. But what I love about the plank is that it's just... so simple. When it was first brought into Formula 1 in 1994, it was exactly that. A plank. A plank so thick and if you wore too much off, you were disqualified. Such a simple way to test if cars were running too low or not. Although in the case of Schumacher and supposedly with Hamilton and Leclerc, you could be running with intolerances, but spinning over a curb or running cars that have to be run low at a bumpy track can do the damage for you, but that's how it is. Well, Benetton claimed it was a curb, but apparently it goes slightly deeper than that. But looking at it, only three disqualifications in 29 years for an illegally worn plank. That's... that's pretty good going, and I'm actually surprised there hasn't been more. But then again, Formula 1 mechanics and engineers are a lot cleverer than I am, so... It is what it is, really. So then, a look at the history of the plank told by a plank. If this has taught you some bits and pieces, then do like the video so I know and good job was done. And for more like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out. Massive thanks to the patrons of Patreon for the support, and if you want to help out on a more personal level, then a link to Patreon can be found in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and my affiliate links with the F1 store and Mix Garage in there too. For those that want to be a channel member, then there's a button under this video, along with super thanks for those worn and done kind of donations. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.